What's up everybody? So in this video, we're going to be talking about diversity of organisms. So this um, is in the chapter A3.1 and there's a whole bunch of stuff we're going to talk about. And remember, at the end, I always have some IB questions and answers and these will really help you to test yourself and see if you understand the key things. And remember, these are past paper questions. So they're not something I make up, they're real past paper questions. So I really encourage you to try them, okay? Now, let's just get started. Let's just get started. Remember, this video will include, will include everything you need to know. So just watch this and you'll be all good. Okay, so I like to start off like this. How does your room look like? Are you a tidy person or are you a messy person? Like if you're me, you, you, your, your day goes like this, right? You, will, you go up and you go, come, from, come from school, come from work, whatever. And you see your room, you're like, mm, it's a bit messy, but I'm tired, I'm going to sleep, I'll leave it. The next day, you're like, mm, it's a, uh, a bit more messy today, but uh, I don't feel like it next day. And then eventually, many days, many months pass, and you're like, okay, this is now enough, this is bloody embarrassing, and you decide to just spend the whole day cleaning it up, right? And then finally, cycle resets and the whole thing repeats, right? So in a way, I do organize my room, and I don't know how you guys are. But the same thing with the fridge, a lot of people have... A lot of food in their fridge and need to organize it in different ways. Some people keep it everywhere, whatever. Some people, even with candy, M&Ms, even though I know they all taste the same, some people keep telling me, no, the blue one's the best or the green one's the best or whatever. They like to organize them and eat the green ones first and the blue ones or whatever. I don't do this, but I know some people do. So what, what am I saying? What am I trying to get at? So what, what were all of these examples about? All of these examples were about organizing, classifying, categorizing things. You're cleaning your room, you're organizing your shirts and your pants together, you're organizing the vegetables and the meat and separately, you're organizing the colors, right? So naturally, humans love to organize things, classify things, categorize things. So just how all of these examples are small, there's a real example that's very important to understand, and it's about organizing, classifying organisms, right? So we have a lot of organisms on our planet. Well, um, name a few, let's say lion, let's, I don't know that many organisms, but lions, humans, um, giraffe, elephant, plants, you know, trees, so many organisms. Now, just like you organize your room every now and then, some guy decided, and his name was Aristotle, he decided, he decided okay, the world's a mess, I don't understand the organisms, they're all this, the whole, they're all chaotic, I want to put some order to all this stuff. So he tried to find a way to classify the organisms, uh, put them into categories, essentially. So I'm going to tell you what he just, what he did, but I'm pretty sure what he did, anyone would do. So I'm going to ask you, what would you do? How would you classify all the organisms on Earth? How would you do it? So this is how he did it. And I'm pretty sure this is how everyone would do it. He took all the living organisms and he said, okay, those things that move and run around and eat things, they, I'm going to call them animals. And he called them animals. And then the, all the other things, the green things, the things that grow but they don't move, the plants, he put them into another category. And then he looked at the plants and he was like, mm, that plant looks different from that one. And he put them into subcategories. Same with the animals. He took the animals and he said, okay, that, that thing, that ape looks different from us, so I'm going to put it into a different category. So this is what he did. It's very basic, and it makes sense. It's what we would do. It's what I would do as well, to be honest, with the knowledge that, um, that he had back then. Because remember, he, he existed a long time ago. So what's wrong with his way? His way is okay, but there's some things wrong with it. For example, he did not know about bacteria. In reality, there should be another category called bacteria, right? These microorganisms that we cannot see with our eyes. But of course, we can't blame him. How could he know that, right? And another thing that's wrong is he didn't consider evolution, right? In fact, we know, although there are these subcategories of animals, some animals evolved from some animals. For example, a human should rather not be a separate category, but rather be evolved from an ape or something like that, right? He didn't consider evolution. So evolution would change the way we classify organisms in a more accurate way. So because he was not entirely correct, another guy came into existence, right? And he said, hmm, I see Aristotle's way, but I think based on the knowledge I have now, because, right, the next guy would be, old, uh, would be born more recently, he would know more. So he decided, okay, I know more. I'm going to try something. And this guy's name was Corollus Linnaeus. Don't worry about the names. It's just to put a, put a face to the guy, um, put a name to the guy. There's another guy. So he came after... Aristotle, right? Aristotle, after. So he had more knowledge. And he started the idea of taxonomy. So taxonomy is the science of identifying, naming, and grouping organisms. Pretty much what I just talked about. It's pretty much a fancy way of saying what we just talked about, taxonomy. So he started this whole thing, the idea of naming. And so you call him a, a taxonomist. A taxonomist does taxonomy. Okay, now, 
he what did he start? He started this idea, which we call the binomial system of classification. Okay, so first, bi. Bi means two, right? Like bi from bicycle, which has two wheels. No meal means name. So he started this two name classification system. What does this mean? What the hell does this mean? Let me let me illustrate with a nice example of these nice and expensive, beautiful, shiny cars called Lamborghinis. So if I ask you, point at the vehicle, which one do you point at? You cannot point at any one specifically, right? Because they are all vehicles. They are all they all fall under the category of vehicles. Okay. But if I say point at the car, well, they still are, even though car is more specific than vehicle, they all still fall under the category vehicle. Now, let me say green car. Even though green car is even more specific, they all still fall under category of green car. Okay, let's say Lamborghini. Even though Lamborghini is very specific, these three are all Lamborghinis, so they all fall under that category. Okay, what if I say Lamborghini Aventador? Okay, Lamborghini Aventador. If you know your Lamborghinis, you would point at this one. That's a Lamborghini Aventador. Okay, so if I say Lamborghini Urus, you'd point at this one. If I say Lamborghini Hurricane, you'd point at this one. Because those names are specific enough to classify this specific car. So let me, let me um, make clear why I'm talking about this. So just like I just said, brand was Lamborghini. They are all Lamborghini. So they all fall under the category of Lamborghini. They all are the brand Lamborghini. But the second part that I talked about, so if I said Lamborghini Aventador, this is the model. The model is a more specific kind of Lamborghini, okay? So this example, what I just talked about, is what he did, but with real organisms. He had this two-name system, just like this, a more broad name in the front, and then a more specific name in the back, okay? He had a more broad name in the, and so he always named organisms with two, two names, blah, 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 blah. The first one, the prior name would be more broad, and the second, and the, um, the last word would be the more specific one. Okay, so that is the binomial system of classification. And because I use these cars and no one cares about cars, you're not going to be asked about cars in your test. Let's look at a real example of a real organism to see how this thing applies. Okay, okay, here. So same stuff up here, nothing new. We're going to look now at these two bears, right? Because they're both bears. So if I ask you to point at the bear, which one do you point at, right? You can't, they're both bears. So according to his way of naming organisms, right? His way of classifying these organisms. How um, how is it going to work for these bears? Let me show you. So this one here, right? The common name, let me show you, would be the American grizzly bear. Okay, the American grizzly bear. So this is not a science name. So this is the English name, right? But science names always uses another language called Latin. Okay, because Latin is the standard science language. So all scientists around the world will use Latin because they can all agree on things and it's much more easy to communicate and there's a standard, right? So this is the English name. It's called the American grizzly bear. But according to the science, the binomial system of classification, we're going to call this bear Ursus Americanus. So remember how I just mentioned mod brand and model. Brand is essentially genus. So genus is the way we're going to name this more broad category that we called before the brand. Okay, we're going to call it now genus, genus. Then the more specific one here, um, this the latter uh, word is called the species, and this is the binomial system of classification. Two names, genus, more broad, species, more specific. So I can put it here for you. Genus versus species. Genus for general, it's more broad. It's more broad. It has, is a bigger category, right? And species would be more specific, okay? Now let's look at this one. Polar bear, right? It's a polar bear. This is not the science name, but the binomial system of classification is going to be like this. Genus, species again, right? Uh, brand, model, genus, species. Ursus, notice they're the same. So these two bears fall under the same general category called genus, but they have a different species name, a more specific name, right? So this is interesting. So that's why this binomial system of classification is so useful. You can classify organisms in a far more accurate way than this guy we talked about before. Then this guy, right? His thing was far more broad, far more not so smart. So this way is way smarter, right? You can be so specific and scientists can understand each other. So instead of one scientist saying, oh, look at that bear. Um, we, we wrote a paper about this bear and its eating habits. They're gonna be like, what do you mean bear? 
So by using this binomial system, it's more precise and scientists wouldn't get confused with each other, right? Okay, now I want to point out something else you probably didn't notice. There's, there's some rules we need to follow. The genus name is always capitalized, okay? You, you can see your you, you. And the species is always lowercase, okay? Also, they are, if you type, if you type, say, say you're writing a science paper, if you type the name, make sure it's always in italics. If you handwrite it, always make sure it's underlined, both the names, okay? Since we're typing here, it's in italics. So I'll put it here. Some words, so genus, this is the part, this part indicates, so this part, indicates a group of species that are very closely related. So both of these bears um, fall under this category called ursus. This is their, if you, if you go back in time, they eventually um, belong to this group, but since they evolved over time, they became different species. So it's a common ancestor, essentially, genus. Now species is a bit confusing, because species has very has, um, many ways of defining it. So um, many ways, there's no consensus, there's no agreed upon one definition. So we're gonna talk about two definitions in this video that you need to know about, but no, there's dozens, okay? So in this specific definition of species here, um, based on this classification, we're gonna talk about species as a group of organism with shared traits. So these species, um, all of these ones that all the American grizzly bears are considered the same species because they have the same traits. They have the same color, they have the same teeth, all, all that stuff. Okay, so a group of species are organisms with the, sh with the same shared traits. Okay, um, you can even see here, I followed the rule. See, the genus was capital um, and the species was non-capital and it's in italics because it's typed. Okay, great, I hope this makes sense, it's very important. Now, I wanna show you some funny example. So here we have an organism, it's beautiful. You definitely want this in your bed at night. Um, its scientific name or its binomial system of classification is Agra Svarvenegri. Um, okay, so again, A, capitalized because it's the genus and this Svarvenegri is um, lowercase. Now, why? I wanna show you this, this is funny because this organism is this is its scientific name, but the species name comes from the fact that it has these big biceps like Arnold Schwarzenegger. You know Arnold Schwarzenegger, this guy, famous bodybuilder, Olymp um, um, Mr. Olympia. Um, he has these big biceps, so they decided to name this organism because it has these big legs, Ar Agra Schwarzenegger. It's, that's, his, that's this guy's name. So this is just a fun fact, don't worry about this. Just interesting to see what some scientists do. They, they do have humor, even though they're, they're geeky. Okay, here's some other examples. I'm not gonna talk about these. So giraffe wouldn't be called giraffe. It'd be to have this name. Lion would have this this name, this um, binomial name, right? So these names in reality, giraffe and lion, it's just names us ordinary people like to use because it's more simple. But scientists, and when you talk, when you do real research and stuff, they'll use these names, much more accurate. Because giraffe is it's not even accurate. There are many kinds of giraffe, as you can see. This one, for example, would be called giraffe camelopardus. Okay, now, now this will make sense for you. So we just remember, we just talked about genus species. So species was very specific and genus was more general. So guess what? There's even a category more general than genus, it's called family. And even more general than family called order. And even more general than order called class and in phylum and kingdom and domain. This is the most broad category. Like domain would include three big categories and one is like um, eukary eukaryotic organisms, right? That's all organisms like plants, animals. And then another category would be bacteria. And then another category here would be archaea. So domain has these three big categories. And in those categories, they have their own kingdoms and then phylum. So it basically, you need to remember this because this is the way all organisms are named from most general to most specific. I'm going to give you examples here. Now, first, a good way to remember this thing this order is D, C, D, K, P, C, O, F, G, S. Remember, it's from general to specific. Um, like, I, okay, I'm gonna, this might not, not, might not make that much sense to you, so I'm gonna relate it back to the car. Remember how I said, point at the vehicle. So vehicle is very broad. So we can pretend the vehicle is like the domain. And then I said, point at the car. So car is more specific than vehicle, so that would be like the kingdom, 
right? And then green car would be even more specific. That'd be like the phylum. So what I'm what we're introducing here is just a the full way of classifying organisms. Binomial is when you use these two names to name the organism. But the real full classification involves all of these. But it would take so long to name every organism all the way from domain to species. So the binomial system only considers the genus and the species. But you need to know about this system, the order of them. So a good way to remember is, dear Kevin, please come over for sex. Okay? So you can also remember it if you don't like this way. But I, I'm pretty sure you'll never forget this way ever because it scarred me a bit. So... You can think of it like, dear Kevin, please come over for good soup or whatever. You can make up your own thing. This is just a way you'll never forget, I guarantee you. So you sit there in the test and they ask you to write down the order of classification. You can just remember, dear Kevin, you know, you can try and remember this. Dear Kevin, please come over for sex, right? Whatever. Okay, let's look at this example here. So you got four organisms here because I want to illustrate this a bit better for you. This will make so much sense after this. So if we look at domain, what is the domain of all these organisms? All of these organisms fall under the category of eukarya. That is one of the three domains that exist. If you look at all living things on Earth, they can be classified into one of these three big categories, okay? Um, uh, which, is, which are all called domain. You learned about eukaryotic cells, right? That's one of the things we learned about earlier in this chapter. So all, organ, all, all eukaryotic celled organisms go under the category, the category, the domain called eukarya. So guess what? All of these are eukaryotic organisms. So we put them into the domain called eukarya. Okay. If there was a bacteria here, it would go into the other other domain called bacteria. Okay. So we're just keeping it all in eukarya here. Okay. So kingdom. So kingdom is more specific. So let's 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 show. So kingdom. There are various. There are six kingdoms. So these can be classified into either of these kingdoms. For example, this one is classified into the kingdom called Animalia, whereas this one is in plant, and that's animal and animal, okay? So that's already, see, already we can see a difference um, between a plant and an animal at this point. Okay, then we go to phylum. So there are many, many kinds of phylum. You don't need to remember any of them, okay, at the moment. Don't need to remember any of them. Just know we're going now from general, remember, gene, general, to specific. So we're going more specific. So now we can see they're all, all um, now we can see that this one is starting to get different. So this one, the polar bear, at the phylum level is different from the lion and the tiger. It's called a chordata. Oh no, it's still the same. Chordata, chordata, chordata. So at the phylum level, all of these organisms are still have the same name, except the plant, of course. We go even more specific. Even at the order, they're all the same. Mammalia, mammalia, mammalia. They're all the same. At the next one, even at um, uh, this one, order, I mean the previous one was class. For order, they're all the same. Carnivora, carnivora, carnivora. Let's go even more specific to family. Here we can see a difference. So only at the family is a bear distinguished from these, these cats, right? It's called Ursidae. So now it is different. This is where its name gets different. Because these are Philidae, Philidae, which just means cat. So let's see where these two get different. So if we look at genus, even at genus, these two are still similar. They're still called Panthera. But at species, they are finally different. This is Panthera leo, and that's Panthera tigris. So I just wanted to show you how this classification thing works all the way from general to specific. You don't know, need to know any of these specific names. Trust me, I'm just trying to get this point across. But you do need to know these categories. Domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And that's the way. This way right here is how you're going to remember it. Okay, great. Now, binomial system, pourquoi? Why? Why do, we need to, why do we need this binomial system? I kind of touched upon it already. But first of all, the names can be universally understood, right? I hope you know one of these languages, because you should. But here is Remy, and these are ways that different languages call this kind of organism, right? English, rat. Russian, this one. Afrikaans, rot. This one, some language that I forgot. Oh no, this is, this, this right here is, guess what? This is the binomial system of classification. Ratus norvegisus. And this is Chinese, Lao Shu. This is Rata, some other language. Okay, so there are so many ways you can classify, you can call a rat. So that's why this binomial system is important because scientists aren't going to care about any of these except this one. Let me make it italics. I forgot to make it italics. Um, they're only going to care about this one, right? All scientists will follow, will follow this, so there will be no. It will be universally understood among the world among scientists. That's one reason why. Okay, next one. Each organism has a unique name and cannot be confused with another, right? Because this naming system is so specific, 
um, you cannot, it's impossible for two organisms to have the same name. So that's why this is useful. You cannot confuse them with one another. Okay. Um, lastly, stability, right? Because this is a official thing, right? A scientific, it's an official thing in the scientific community. Um, no one can just change it. No random guy off the street can be like, hmm, I'm going to change the name of this organism because I feel like it. No, you can't. So this is a very strict system. So it allows for stability. Names cannot change without valid reason. So it's very useful and reliable. So these are the three key reasons of why we actually care about this binomial system that we just learned. Okay. Now, we know, right? Look at yourself. You have many, many, look at yourself. You have many, many traits, right? Eye color, uh, hair color, height, um, blood type, um, your earlobe may be attached or separated. You you may have a, if you um, do thumbs up, your thumb may bend, be, be very bendy and bend backwards. Your thumb might be straight. You have so many traits, right? So there are two kinds of um, traits you need to know about. Traits that have continuous variation, okay? These kind of traits that have continuous variation, continuous meaning like um, there's no specific yes or no answer. Okay, that's what continuous means. There's infinite possibilities. It's continuous. This is when the variation has a wide range of possibilities. So there's no specific value. For example, height. You can be 185 centimeters in height. You can be 185.1 centimeters in height. You can be 2 meters in height. You can be 150 in height, 140 in height. There's absolutely infinite possibilities. This is called continuous variation. So Traits that, specific traits that um, have continuous variation would include your height because that's infinite possibilities. Your eye color, even your eye color, you may think it's simple, blue, green, um, brown, um, but actually it's just like your height. There are many kinds of green, there are many kinds of blue. So just like your height, eye color is continuous variation. So just like this giraffe, it can be short, it can be this tall, this tall, this tall, this tall, this tall, right? It can be many, many, many things. These are continuous variation traits. Just a term you need to know. Um, now, there's another one called discontinuous variation, and it's the exact opposite. So instead of having a wide range of possibilities, there are distinct categories. For example, your blood type. You can either be A, B, AB, or O. No other possibilities. There's no intermediates. So these are examples of discontinuous variations. They, are, they have distinct categories. Blood types, an example. I also talked about the earlobe. Your earlobe can be attached or not attached. There's no intermediate. Um, yeah, there's a lot, you can Google a lot of, um, of these examples. You'll see some interesting ones. So these are two key terms you need to know. Okay, now we just talked before, okay, about one definition of species, right? One definition. We can classify species based on their traits. And that's the, and that's the whole point of this, um, of this uh, classification system. We go from general to specific, and we separate these species based on certain traits, right? So one way of, of defining species is organisms that have the same traits. So this one, all of these tigers will have the same traits, so they're the same species, right? So another way of defining species is interesting. It's called the biological species concept. So it's these two definitions of species you need to know. The one I just mentioned based on similarities in traits, and this one, which is called the biological species concept, and it works like this. It is species are to be organisms are to be classified as the same species. Wait, let me just restart that. I <laughs> let me just read what it says. To be classified as the same species, two organisms must be able to breed together and produce produce ver fertile offspring. For example, um, you take your dog, you take another person's dog, you breed them together. Their kid, that baby, will be able to also have a baby. So therefore. The two dogs that bred together are the same species, right? So all dogs are the same species because you can take any dog, make them reproduce, and their baby will be able to have a kid as well. But if you take, um, um, let's say, a horse and a tiger and you make them have kids, if they can have a kid, if by some magic they have a kid, that kid will not be fertile, meaning that baby will not be able to have a kid. Therefore, the horse and the tiger are not the same species. So to be classified as the same species, two organisms must be able to reproduce and their child must be able to also have a child. Otherwise, the parents were not species, were not the same species. I hope this makes sense. It's like humans. When we uh, uh, reproduce with another human, 
our baby will also be able to have a baby. Therefore, us humans, we are the same species. But if a human has um, uh, does it with another organism, that organ, that that baby will not be able to have a um, have have their own kid. Therefore, the two parents were not the same offspring and were not the same species. So, what's the problem with this definition? You need to know the problem with this definition. Let me show you some. First one is this. What about asexually reproducing organisms? Because we just said, to be able to be classified as the same species, you these two organisms that reproduce, their kid must be able to have a kid. But what if there's an organism that doesn't need a partner? It can reproduce by itself. So how do you classify it, um, um, those organisms as the same species? Because they don't reproduce with each other. If you, For example, if you have two bacteria, they reproduce by themselves, asexually. So does that mean that those bacteria are, are not the same species just because they can't reproduce together, right? So this is one problem because this problem relies on the fact that the organisms must be able to sexually reproduce, whereas a lot of organisms produce asexually, okay? Now, this one, remember how I just said, hybrids, so hybrids are um, babies that are formed from two different species. For example, if you take a horse and a zebra and they have a kid, that baby is called a hybrid because it's a mix of two, two different species. So um, I just said, when you form a hybrid, they should not be able to reproduce, right? They should be infertile. Um, but the problem is scientists have found that some hybrids are actually um, not infertile, meaning they, they, uh, they are fertile. Meaning that they have found examples where, for example, they take a horse and a zebra that reproduces to make a baby. They found examples where that baby would be able to have a kid. But that doesn't mean that the two original parents were actually the same species because they weren't. So there are some exceptions to the hybrid to the hybrid idea of being infertile. Okay, next one, extinct species. So what about extinct species? Because if a species is extinct, how can we figure out if they were able to reproduce? Like for example, how do we know for sure that dinosaurs were able to reproduce, right? So therefore, some dinosaurs, we, we, cannot, we don't even know if they're the same species or not because we could never figure out if they could reproduce or not because they're extinct. So this definition is also not good for explaining extinct species. Okay, next one. Some organisms are made up of DNA from multiple organisms, meaning they have many moms and dads, right? So in this and this, but this is specific plants and flowers and stuff like that. So don't worry about that too much. But this definition doesn't consider that because this definition considers two parents, whereas um, some organisms have many parents. Okay, but don't worry about this one too much. If you know these three, that's, that's pretty solid already. Um, and this definition, by the way, is more recent than the, um, than the one we talked about before with the, this one based on characteristics, based on traits. Okay, great. So what I'm just going to cover what we just talked about because it's long and I want to make sure we're on the same page. So far we talked about classifying organisms. In this category, we talked about the morphology for classifying organisms. So that includes the whole binomial classification of organisms. There was a lot under this one. Then we went on to the new definition of organisms or the a more recent one. Neither one is correct. Right? They're just different examples um, called the biological species concept, which you need to know. Now we're going to talk about speciation. So speciation. So speciation in most simple terms is the process of forming new species. So if we read this, the process by which a population is separated into two groups that can no longer reproduce together. Right? Because if we follow the previous definition of species, we know that species are two organisms that can reproduce and produce fertile offspring, meaning offspring that can have kids. So, speciation would be when an organism um, becomes, when an organism over time becomes different, when becomes different species, meaning they can no longer reproduce to pro reproduce to produce fertile offspring. So, let me show you a story about how that happens. So, say there's an environment and we have this fishy, okay, and there's certain plants and certain corals and things to eat. And there's a lot of these fishies, okay, a lot of them. Now they swim and then these get busy here and it gets crowded so this one can't eat there anymore. So he decides to swim here and eat here and this one is like, ah, oh, there's one more spot he goes there and this one goes here to eat here. And then over time, um, these, because these uh, tend to be, uh, be around this coral here and these tend to be around this green plant here or these algae here, 
they don't really interact with each other. So these two will not really interact with those. So it's more likely for these here to reproduce with each other. So these two here. And then they will have a kid. And their kid will most likely not go to this area and rather reproduce here because that's where its parents are. And the same thing here. These will reproduce with each other and their kid will stay around here. And then over time, many generations, these fishies become slightly different. Their DNA over time of reproducing changes a little bit up to a point where the fishies are now different species. Okay, up to a point where this happens. Let me show you. Let's say these fishies here became different. Their genetics are now different. Over time, uh, speciation happened. And then these fishies here, over time, became different. Now, it was so long that we call this speciation because now when these fishies go together and try and, um, you know, do it, they're not going to be able to have a kid because now they're different species. So this is speciation. This is the process of making a new species. So this is one example of how it can happen. So if I put a diagram here of how it works is we had the original fish over many generations because of environment and how the circumstances were. Some fishies became this species, some fishies became that species, and now they're classified as different species. Why? Because they cannot reproduce to produce fertile offspring. That's what a species is. So that's one way of how speciation can happen. So this is where they split, the speciation split. So I hope that makes sense. Okay, great. So now we covered these three things. Okay, we're done now with classifying organisms. Now we're going to get into an interesting part here, um, uh, which is also about this topic, diversity of organisms, right? Because now we talked about diversity of organisms here in terms of how we can give them different names, how we can classify them, diversity and how we name them and all that sort of stuff. Now we're going to talk about diversity of organisms in terms of genetics, in terms of DNA and chromosomes and all that. So we're going to look at, so this whole chapter, right, is called diversity of organisms. This one here is looking at the naming, and this one here is looking at diversity in terms of chromosomes and DNA and that kind of thing, right? So it's not a different topic. It's just a different aspect of this topic that we need to know about. So we want to start here. Who's this guy here? It's Brad Pitt, right? Most ladies are going to like this guy. Brad Pitt. Just like Brad Pitt, right? What's Brad Pitt made of? A lot, a lot of cells. Billions and billions of these cells, right? I'm going to just show something here because it'll make the rest of the video make much more sense. So what is this organelle here? This organelle here is your nucleus, right? Your nucleus contains what? Your DNA, your genetic material, your instruction manual, right? Your cells are going to read this instruction manual, do what it says, and as long as you're um, and make a lot of stuff to make you the way you are, right? So your DNA, okay, this is your DNA, right? It's all of these, you, you, um, we, covered, we covered this in B, I think, B1.1. No, it wasn't B1.1. Something else, some other topic. Well, it could have been A, actually. I think it was A, because I already made a video on it. In one of the topics, we covered DNA. And DNA is, this, is your genetic material, right? And it's made up of these letters, these four letters, A, C, T, and G, right? And, and then you'll have different orders of those letters and blah, blah, blah. So this is your DNA. And your DNA can be folded up into this small structure here. These pink things are little proteins. We call them histones, right? Histones. And these histones, will your DNA will wrap around these histones, kind of like beads on a string. And this will form a little structure called a nucleosome. And then these nucleosomes, many of these nucleosomes will form. This is one nucleosome. This is a nucleosome. Many of these will form, and then those will wrap around each other, and it will keep wrapping, keep wrapping, until we have a chromosome. So that's really what a chromosome is. A chromosome is a really tight wrapping of your DNA. Okay, why am I talking about this? Why am I talking about this? Because of this. So chromosomes. So as I just said, let's reveal this. We got a guy. got a human, right? And this, this time we have who? The rock. More famous than Brad Pitt. Then we know the rock's made up of cells. We know inside his nucleus, we got chromosomes. Okay. Okay. Now your chromosome, I need to reveal this. Your chromosomes, you have, um, depending what species you are, you will have a different number of chromosomes. So for example, um, a human has 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs. Okay. So here we have something, I'll give you a name now. We, we call this a karyogram karyogram. A karyogram, karyo means nucleus. So we know inside your nucleus you have chromosomes. So this is a gram. Gram is like a picture. Gram means picture. Um, so that's why it's called Instagram as well, right? Instant pictures. So karyogram um, is a picture of your 
nucleus. So in inside your nucleus, you have these chromosomes. Therefore, it's a picture of your chromosomes. So let me put this here. OK, now your karyogram is in a standard format. So you can see here, um, we have all of these chromosomes. And you can see we, we have this pair, we have this pair, this pair, this pair, all the way down to here, right? These 23 pairs. Notice something. The size of a, um, the new chromosomes will decrease. So pair one would be the biggest chromosomes. Pair two would be slightly smaller, slightly smaller, until 22, which is the smallest. And then this last pair, this 23rd pair, is um, your X and Y chromosomes. They determine your gender, right? So that's one thing we notice. We notice that the karyogram has all these chromosomes and they decrease in size from biggest to smallest. Notice that you have um, two of each pair. So of pair one, you have one and another one, right? One from your dad, one from your mom. In this case, when you have two from each pair, we call it diploid, diploid, diploid. So this is a diploid karyogram because you have two of each pair, one from the mom, one from the dad. Most, almost all of your cells have this scenario in their nucleus, okay? There's only two, um, two kinds of cells that don't have this, and I'll, sh I'll tell you what they are now. Um, so one is from your mom, one is from your dad. We call it diploid because di means two, right? And you've got two pairs. Um, and so we call it 2N because you've got two pairs. I mean, you've got two in each pair. And then if you only have one in each pair, so let's say you only have one chromosome one, one chromosome two, one chromosome three, that's called haploid. And they just call it N because you only have one, one in each pair. Now, which kind of cells are haploid? Guess, guess. Which cells would have half the amount of DNA than all the other cells? Your gametes. Your gametes are called your X and Y chromosomes. I mean, your, your uh, sex cells, such as your sperm and egg, because they need to have half the amount of DNA. Because otherwise, because think about it, and when an egg meets a sperm, they each have half the amount of DNA. So when they fertilize each other, or come together to make a baby, they will each donate half DNA, right? Because they only have half of the DNA each. So when they donate their DNA together, then they have a full set of DNA. That will become a baby, a real organism. Okay, so that's diploid and haploid. Okay. Now, depending what your chromosome scenario is, we call that your karyotype. So uh, this would be the rock's karyotype. Okay, this is a karyogram, a picture of his, nucle uh, of his nucleus, of his chromosomes, but his karyotype, for example, would be male, um, 23 pairs of chromosomes. That's his karyotype. Okay, now, let me highlight something important. So we can split this um, karyogram into two. All those chromosomes and this one. So these chromosomes in red are called your autosomes autosomes. They determine all of your body's traits, right? And these X and this last pair is called your sex chromosomes. They determine your sex. Your sex. Are you male? Are you female, right? A male would be XY, whereas a female would be XX. So this could have just as well been XX, and then it'd be a female, okay? Um, anything else? Why? Okay, I guess this is very important. Why do we care about this? Um, a lot of scientists like to make your karyogram before you are born. Okay, before you are born. Um, well, actually, let's first look at the first example, gender. A lot of times, um, you can look at your karyotype because a lot of, there's a lot of disorders, right? Where you, where people have like XXY or XXX or different um, gender things, like it's it's um, diseases, right? So you can use this, this karyogram to look at gender. So a lot of the times you can simply, uh, scientists can just take DNA, for example, from a crime scene and they can produce this karyogram and see if it was a male or a female, or they can find information from it. And another very important thing that they can find from it is prenatal diagnosis. Prenatal means before you are born. So a lot of people want to figure out if their baby will have a problem before, before they are born. Um, for example, your mother may, may have a genetic condition and she wants to make sure you will not have that genetic condition. So the scientists can make this and see if you have that chromosome problem. For example, we know that um, Down syndrome is a problem where you have three of these 21s instead of two, right? So doctors can take a, can, when, you're, uh, when your mom is pregnant, they can take a sample and check if the baby will have Down syndrome or not. So that's another useful thing about being able to make a, a karyogram. Okay.
Now, how do you make a karyogram? This is very important. How do we make this thing? We just talked about this thing, what it is. It's pretty much all your chromosomes arranged from big to small. So it's not naturally like this. Scientists had to arrange it from big to small. Um, I'll show you exactly how that's done just now. And it has two purposes. Now, how do we make one? So here we have a mom. Um, to make one, because we want, let's say, let's say we want to figure out if this baby is going to have Down syndrome or not. So they want to make a karyogram. The scientists want to take a sample and see if it's going to be have Down syndrome or not. So what they do is they go in here and they take a sample from somewhere, where there's the amniotic fluid here, where there's the placenta here, whatever. They take a sample. Through uh, there's many ways you can do it. I'll show you now. So you can take sample through many ways, amniotic fluid, which is the fluid which the baby is in, because the baby is floating in this fluid, right? And this fluid will have its cells, because the cells, like, like your skin cells, right? Your skin cells fall off of you sometimes, right? So it's the same way, the baby's cells can fall off and it can have its DNA in there. So if the scientist takes a sample, they can look at the DNA. Another one is blood sample. They can go into the placenta here, take a blood sample, because um, the baby's blood is the same as the mother's blood, so the baby's uh, uh, DNA should be, in, should be in there. They can also take chronic villi sampling, which is also here in the placenta. Um, then they can take, take these, these cells and they can culture them, meaning they can, this is the baby cells, they can grow them, make many of them. Then they can um, destroy the whole cell except the nucleus, right? So they can have the chromosomes. So then they destroy the whole cell except the nucleus, so then they see the chromosomes. Now the chromosomes, like I said, is a mess. It's not going to be, it's not going to be this organized. It's going to be a complete and utter mess. So what the scientists then need to do is organize them according to size and stain them so they can be color colorful or whatnot. Because look, here they're colorful, but in reality they're not colorful. So the scientists will stain them, make sure that they have color, so you can see all the genes. All of these lines represent different genes, right? But this is done with some kind of computer software. You'll see they don't do it by hand. Obviously they have some software that helps them do that. And then finally, they organize it according to size and all that, and here's your karyogram. So this is how you make a karyogram. Take a sample, grow the cells, destroy the cells, accept the chromosomes, organize the chromosomes according to size and stain them, and that's your karyogram. So we can see this baby is a normal male. There's no chromosomal abnormalities. We are not, very important, we are not able to see if there are genetic problems, like a small gene problem, because that's, a karyogram only shows the chromosomes. So we can see if there's a chromosomal problem, such as a missing chromosome or a um, additional chromosome or a very big chromosome and a small chromosome. That's what they can see, but they cannot see very fine detail on a karyogram, very small genetic problems. Okay, here, uh, I wanted to show you this before. Here is an example of a how this karyogram can be useful. Here's a karyogram of a certain baby, and we can see, again, from big to small, and then this um, two X chromosomes to show it's a female, so it's two X. Remember, normally the male um, has one X is the big chromosome, and Y would be a very tiny one. So this is X Y. That's how you know um, that's a male. It's big one is X, small one is Y, because we can see on this picture there's two big X chromosomes, so it's a female. Um, and we can see here what's what's unique. So it's organized from big to small, but chromosome 21 there's three. So that is going to be down syndrome or trisomy 21 trisomy 21 is another name for it there's three chromosomes at 21 uh, interestingly some of these 50 uh, percent of these patients have this you know if you have how you have a crease on your hand you can look at your hand um, uh, they have a crease that can continues all the way through that's only this doesn't happen in all the patients though and obviously they have specific features that are pretty characteristic so what uh, a point we need to make here, what I want to say is, because we know now about karyograms, we know about chromosomes, and I just told you that um, humans have, us have 46 chromosomes or 23 pairs, right, 22 and the last pair is the sex chromosomes. So what you need to know is, since we're talking about diversity of organisms, you need to know that different organisms have different number of chromosomes. So a human here, a homo sapien, again, that's the binomial classification, we are homo sapiens, genus, species. So we have 46 chromosomes. If they're haploids, so our sex cells, it will be 23 because it's half. Uh, but if you're a chimpanzee, you have 48 chrom um, uh, chromosomes or 24 pairs. If you're a dog, you have 39 hap um, uh, chromosomes or uh, 39 pairs or 78 chromosomes. So different species have different number of chromosomes. So species also are different. Also, 
um, are diverse in terms of their chromosomes. Not only their external traits that we've talked about in this video, also their DNA is different. Okay, great. So something interesting that you need to know about, it's quite, it's quite interesting. I'm not going to linger on it too much because it's, uh, I don't think they'll go too heavy on this. Um, but something that I want to know about is the evolution of human chromosome 2. So, right, let's look at our, so look at our thing here. So they want to look at how human chromosome 2 was formed because you'll see why. It's interesting. So we know, right, a long time ago, um, I mean, still now, there exist chimpanzees, right? And there also exists us, humans. They believe, scientists believe something interesting is going on with chromosome 2. They believe that chromosome 2 from the human was formed by the fusion of chromosome 12 and 13 of a chimpanzee. Because look, a chimpanzee, right, has 24 haploid chromosomes. So if one of the chromosomes fuse, that makes 23, which is the human amount, right? So that's one theory of how um, chimpanzees evolved into humans. The fact that their chromosomes, one of their chromosomes, two of their chromosomes fused together. Thereby, they technically lost a chromosome because two became one. And that is how they believe, that's one theory of how they believe humans formed. Okay? The other theory was this. The other theory was that one chromosome just disappeared. But this theory was unlikely because your chromosomes, remember, they contain DNA. They contain your genetic material. If a chromosome just disappears, you'll have serious disease or serious disability. So they didn't believe that this would be possible. They didn't believe that this is the reason. They believed that it was because two of these chromosomes fused. That way, all the DNA is still there. You didn't, you didn't lose a chromosome. So what is their evidence? Because you can't just go around saying, I believe this is how it is and that's it, right? You gotta have evidence. So scientists did have evidence and three pieces of evidence, which we're gonna talk about. Um, first, we gotta label something. So here are the chromosomes. Normally, chromosomes have, or well, actually always, they have a little piece somewhere that is indented, and we call that our centromere, right? And if the centromere is near the edge, it has a certain name, and if it's near the middle, it has a certain name, okay? So, for example, if it's in the middle, we're going to call it metacentric. So this is a metacentric um, chromosome because it has its centromere, this is indented part, uh, in the middle. But if it's here, for example, on this chromosome, which is near the end, it is called acrocentric. Acrocentric. So you need to know those two words. Acrocentric and metacentric. Acrocentric, when the centromere is near the edge of the chromosome, and metacentric, when it's near the middle. So you can see a human is uh, metacentric. It's more near the middle, right? Okay, so again, they believe that how chrom human chromosome 2 formed was by the fusion of chromosome 12 and 13 from a chimpanzee. So let's put it here. Fusion. I'm going to explain what the evidence is just now. Right, and they believe that we f um, f uh, uh, originally had a common ancestor and over time, we caused, remember we talked about speciation, right? How species form. They believe this speciation formed because of this fusion. Okay, what's the evidence? So, the evidence is here. First evidence. Chromosome 2 arises from fusion of chromosome 12 and 13 because it is similar length when overlapped. That's evidence 1. Think about it. Here's chromosome 12, here's chromosome 13. If you overlap them, they are going to be the same length as human chromosome 12, uh, 2. So that is one evidence for it. It's the same length when you overlap them. So if you fuse them, it's going to be the same length. That's one evidence. What else? They also noticed that the banding pattern is similar. Banding is these lines, these genes, right? You can see it. They noticed that the banding pattern from 12 here is very similar to the top of the banding pattern from human chromosome 2. The same here. The banding pattern of chromosome 13 is very similar to the banding pattern of human chromosome 2, bottom half. So that's another evidence. Okay, here. They also realized, so, very important here. This will make sense now. At the end of each chromosome, so here, 
and here is a sequence of DNA, right? Because this is just made of DNA. A chromosome is made from DNA. So at the end of each chromosome is DNA. But we call that DNA, um, it's a, I mean, at the end of each chromosome, there is also DNA, just like the rest of the chromosome. But DNA at the end of the chromosome is slightly different. It doesn't code for any genes. This DNA is more protection. It keeps the chromosome strong and prevents it from degenerating so quickly. So we call this DNA at the end telomere DNA, telomere or telomere DNA. So they found that this part here in human chromosome 2 was telomere DNA. They looked at the sequence of the DNA and found that it's actually telomere DNA. It's the kind of DNA you would find at the end of chromosomes. And that makes sense. Why? Because this area here is exactly where the telomere DNA from chromosome 13 and the telomere DNA from chromosome 12 from chimpanzee fuse together. So if they fuse together, then this section will have telomere DNA. So scientists managed to prove that here, this section is in fact telomere DNA, which further supports the fusion, the theory that the two chromosomes fuse together. Okay, now what's the last one? I said there are three, but actually there's four. This piece of DNA here, um, in the centromere is also unique. So I just told you that the all of this stuff here codes for your genes and all that things, but the end DNA is called telomere DNA and it's for protection. Now the DNA here at the centromere is also unique in its own way, and we call it satellite DNA. So it's unique in its own way, just like telomere DNA was unique. So because when these two fuse, technically when chromosome 12 and chromosome 13 fuses um, and you form a new chromosome, each chromosome is only allowed to have one centromere. So we already see that chromosome, human chromosome 2 has a centromere up here. But this one here doesn't exist from the chromosome 13. So you, may be, you might be like, okay, well that disproves it because there should be a, a centromere here. In fact, each chromosome, like I said, is only allowed to have one centromere. So when the scientists looked at this section where they thought there would be a centromere, they looked at, it, they looked at the DNA and realized that DNA is satellite DNA. And satellite DNA is, um, is, the, is the centromere DNA. So that's interesting as well. That also uh, proves it, um, uh, provides more evidence, right? So overall, you need to know um, that human, that if a theory, hey, let me show you. You need to know that a theory of how humans um, and, and the speciation between humans and chimpanzees formed was this, was that the human which has 46 chromosomes, came from the chimpanzee that had 48. One of the chromosomes fused together, and that formed the 46 chromosomes, which humans have. And the theory was here that it was chromosome, human chromosome 2 that was formed from the fusion of chimpanzees 12 and 13 chromosome. And the four evidences are this. The fact that the length is the same as when these two would be fused. The fact that the binding pattern or these gene patterns look the same. And the fact that this telomere DNA from both 12 and 13 was exactly present where they would merge on the human chromosome here. And lastly, satellite DNA, where the centromere of 13 was, they found that the bottom half of human chromosome 12 actually had satellite DNA, which is also a unique kind of DNA. So that's very important. Make sure you, you know um, about the evolution of human chromosome 2. Okay, so we just talked about this. Uh, let's, let's, let's recap. So we, class, we now talked about the whole classifying organisms. We talked about all this stuff. We talked now about all of this karyotypes and chromosomes. We talked about how a karyogram is formed. We talked about how different organisms have different chromosomes. We talked about how the evolution of human chromosome 2. And now we're going to talk about this bit here and then do some questions. Okay, so we already get this part, right? I already told you the nucleus, right, has chromosomes. Chromosomes is just wound up DNA into these tight nucleosomes. So what is a genome? A genome. So a genome is a collection of all the bases that your, your DNA possesses. So bases, right, if you watch the, the DNA video, are these letters, these A, C, T, G, these little bases, little, these little colors, the sequence of these colors, right? These are bases, your code. So a genome is your whole code. The most simple way of saying it is, a human being's whole code, your whole DNA, that's your genome, right? All of these bases, the order of these bases, that's your genome. We are almost there, guys, just almost there. I know this is a lot of information, but 
really after watching this hopefully there's no no other videos you need to watch I'm trying to make it as clear as possible uh, I know it sounds like there's a lot more things that might be more interesting to do like, I would love to go get a Starbucks now but you know we're almost there let's just finish this and then do some questions and then we're free to go okay so now we just talked about the genome now um, an interesting thing we need to know about is the human genome project so we know that in our cells we have this DNA right which is stored in our chromosomes and it's got all our information all our code so one thing that scientists did is they did this project called the human genome project in which they pretty much um, sorted out and wrote out all of your bases in the order that they are in your cell. This is called the Human Genome Project. Okay, so they wrote out all of these, your sequence, all of your bases into a book, okay, and why would they do that? So they do, they do that because it is useful, because if you can, if you know the sequence of our DNA, because our DNA is our instruction manual, our code, if you know our code, then certain medications can be developed to help you with certain diseases, specifically by targeting your DNA, by targeting your code. So it used to take a very long time to sequence uh, a genome or, or um, write out your entire genome. Now they can do it much quicker with technology. Um, they even, they even um, some people who have money, some rich people can even do it just on themselves, right? Because they do it with specific um, they've done it before, but they don't do it with, for everyone. You need to have money uh, to pay people to do it. But there's a lot of potential in the future for everyone to be able to do it. So now remember this chapter. It's called diversity of organisms. So another way in which organisms can vary is not only the, the chromosomes that we talked about before, but also their genome, right? Their genome. So the collection of all these bases. So although we all, although humans, right, have uh, the same genome. We all have the same genes. Like I have a gene for hair color. You also have a gene for hair color. I have a gene for, for um, a ear. You have a gene for an ear. Although we have the same genome size, right? We have the same genome size, the same amount of genes. Uh, we can have small differences between us. So if we look at these three people here, like John Wick, Ronaldo, and Bravo, Johnny Bravo, although they have the same genome size, there are slight differences. So every now and then you'll have a base um, for example, let's say he has an A uh, and then um, John Wick will actually have a T instead of an A, uh, whereas Ronaldo in that position may have a G or a C, right? There are small differences every now and then, okay? So it's not going to be the exact same. So although our genome is the same, we have the same genes, our genes may differ a little bit. Some of our genes, genes may have different sequence, right, than other people. So that's very important to understand. Um, so for example, between humans, we only have 0.4% difference in our in our in our in our genome. Only 0.4% difference, uh, different order. Whereas between different species, like human to ape, there's a much bigger difference, 4% difference. So these little differences, these little single base difference, these single nucleotide differences are called single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs because they are single base differences. A nucleotide, right, is this little uh, subunit that that uh, makes up your DNA. So these little subunit differences can exist between different org uh, different species. Uh, I mean, different people. Now, but that is for the same species. If we talk now about different species or different organisms, the genome size differs. Because in the same species, the size is the same. But you may have small SNPs, small SNPs, small differences. Whereas different organisms, they have a different size. For example, if we look at this picture here of this uh, bacteria called E. coli, and this maize, like this corn, and human, if we look at the genome size, notice how the human genome size is much bigger than the maize's, and the maize is much bigger than the E. coli's. So you would, this brings me to the question, do you think the larger your genome, the more complex you are? So this may seem true, right? Because you like, you look at this bacteria and you think a human's more complicated than that, and a human is more complicated than a, than a maize for sure. So you may think that, but it's not actually entirely true, because... Um, there is no real pattern because, for example, there's an organism called a lungfish and it has way more, a way lo uh, larger genome than a human. So this generally isn't true. So it may seem like it most of the time when you look at data. Um, it may seem like it, but it's not actually true. It's not actually true. Um, and the thing is, we can think about this because um, it depends on how you think about the word complex. So if you think a human is complex, why is it? Why is it that, that you think a human is complex? Because we're smart or why, right? 
So complex can have different definitions. So yes, humans can send a spaceship to Mars. That's true. But this organism can survive in insane amounts of in in, in insane um, severely con severe conditions that humans can never survive. So perhaps because it can survive in all these conditions, it has a larger genome to be able to have genes to adapt to all these environments, whereas humans cannot survive in those environments. So just know that there is no real relationship between the larger the genome, the more um, smart the org organism is, okay? Just know that that's, that's not true. Um, why do our genomes differ between different species? Because I told you, between humans, they don't differ because we have the same genes. We, have, we, need, we, we make the same things in our body. But different organisms have different purposes. Like, for example, a plant can make pollen, a flower, uh, pollen, right? Whereas a human cannot make pollen. So we don't have that gene. Where, and also a human has the gene for growing hair, whereas a plant does not have that. A fish has the genes for, for having gills, whereas humans do not have gills. So different organisms have different genes. So therefore, different organisms, their genome can be a different size because they may have more or less genes than other organisms. So make sure you understand that. So that's another way in which um, organisms can, uh, can, can have diversity, right? In terms of the genome. Okay, one last bit here before questions. So remember that our DNA, right? If we say our DNA is like an instruction manual, a code, a book, we know that this book, this code, allows us to make certain products, right? Our body will read this code and make a certain product, like a rocket, let's say in this example. Um, that's the analogy. The real thing is, right, our DNA is going to allow us to make proteins. Our body will read our DNA to make proteins. This is a protein. It's the collection of many of these little things called amino acids. You put them together, that's a protein, and that will be based on your DNA. And since we're talking about diversity of organisms, different organisms... Um, will have different, um, could have DNA differences. And if you have DNA differences, then guess what? Then you have different um, proteins because different DNAs means different amino acids, which means different amino acid sequence means different proteins. So now that's another way in which organisms can differ. So you can actually, a very good way of um, seeing how different species are is uh, by looking not only at their outside because remember before we looked at the outside you looked at the characteristic the features the hair the size the teeth whatever you can also look at their dna to see how different they are so not only can you look at their outside to see how species differ you can look at their dna so for example um, if we look at these four species this one this is the first um, species second third fourth we can see that this is the this is the amino acid sequence for a specific gene for this organism. Now, for the same gene of this of this species, this is its amino acid sequence, and for the exact same gene for this organism, that is its amino acid sequence, and for the same gene of this organism, this turtle, this is its amino acid sequence. So, what what am I trying to say here? Remember, the amino acid sequence or this protein, right? A protein is this chain of amino acids. It is coded for by your DNA. So if your DNA is different, um, you will have a different amino acid sequence. So if we look at this gene, right, this is the same gene in each organism. We can see that they're slightly different amongst organisms because their DNA is different. So because their DNA is different, this protein is different. So let's look at these two. We can see the birds have the least differences. We can see here, um, you don't need to remember these, um, these amino acid sequences or anything. That'd be insane, of course. Just uh, try and understand this concept. So these are not the genes. These are not um, these are not um, the DNA sequences. This is the amino acid sequence. Remember, there's a uh, the gene sequence includes A, T, C, and G. Whereas the amino acid is more there's way more letters. It's like L, G, S, much more than than the DNA, right? So don't get confused. So we can see that between these two species, this is not surprising because these two are birds. They are very similar, even though they may be different species. They are very similar. So you can see in their amino acid sequence, there are very few differences. These yellow bits are where they are different. You can see where this one has an L, this one has a V. Where this one has an NF, this one has a GL. Very few differences because they are similar spe They are similar organisms. So their DNA is not that different. But if we compare this bird with this turtle, we can see there's a huge amount of differences. Far more yellow, yellow um, highlights here, right? Far more differences. So... Not only, so because organisms differ in their terms of their DNA, we can also use that as an advantage to see their differences. 
to look at their DNA and see how different they really are. So that's very useful to know. Okay, now that we're done, we covered now everything. Let's look at this. We covered all of these things, classifying organisms, karyotypes, chromosomes, diversity in genomes, a lot of stuff. Let's now do some questions. Let's go do some questions. Okay, so the scientific name of the Wakatobi flower pecker is Dekeyum koini, whatever, however you want to say that. So which species is most closely related to that one? So remember, this is the... Uh, binomial classification, so this would be genus, and that would be what? Species. Remember, lowercase for the K. So which species would be most closely related? Would it be A, B, C, or D? So what would you say? I would say D. Why would I say D? Most people would say A here, and they're going to be wrong. Why? When we look at, at the classification, right, if an organism is has the same order, let's say they have the same order, carnivora, that means everything above it must be the same, because we're going from general to specific, right? So everything above, if, they are, if, they're the, if they're the same order, they are the same class, phylum, domain, and kingdom, right? They're the same everything above. There's no way you can be the same order and a different class, because we're going from general to specific. If we go back to our analogy, we're going from a vehicle to a um, Lamborghini Urus. We're going from general to specific, right? A Lamborghini Urus, there's no way a Lamborghini Urus cannot be a vehicle. That'd be impossible. So remember, we're going from general to specific. So when, when, um, so we, we, when we look at this question, A is not the right answer because although they have the same species name, they do not have the same genus name, which means they are not similar at all. They're not even the same genus. They're not even the same genus because they have to be the same genus to be similar, Okay because we go from general to specific. So it's definitely not A. It's going to be D because look, this one has the same genus. So these two organisms, D and this one, will be the same up until genus. They are different species, but at, they're at least the same genus. Okay, so that's why it's D. Which statements describes the term species? So we know there are many different definitions of species. Um, there's one here that you need to know. So is it A? Nope. B? Yes. Organisms, repro organisms that reproduce together to produce fertile offspring. This was the biological species definition, right? This is the one you need to know. And uh, again, uh, it's not the, why? Because um, the species is the second word in the binomial name of the organism. Okay, based on binomial nomenclature, which two species are most closely related? Okay. See, they see, they love to ask this. So let's see, genus, species, Berberis, Vogaris. You can try it yourself and see what you get. So I would say A. Why would I say A? So we can say A, we can see organism 1 here has the same genus as organism 4. They are different species, but they have the same genus. So they're very closely related. They're only different in terms of the species. Whereas all of these other three, they have the same species name, but they, they're not even the same genus. So they're very different because that means they're not, they don't have the same origin. They don't have the same, they don't come from the same organism. So they make, could, coincidentally, they happen to have the same species name um, because the scientist, um, maybe, maybe different scientists accidentally named it by the same species, but because they are, don't have the same genus, they're not similar. They're not closely re related. So the answer here would be 1 and 4. So they're, you can see they're always going to try and trick you by making it seem like the species is the same and therefore they should be the most similar. But then the genus is not even the same. So they're not very similar at all. Okay. Ants, bees, wasps are classified in the same order. What can be deduced about these animals? Okay. So here's where it's important to memorize that whole thing. So where's order? So order is here. Okay, so it's very broad. It's above genus and species and all that. So what was the question? So all of these three are classified in the same order. What can be deduced about these animals? They are classified in the same class. Let's see. So if you're the same order, are you the same class? Yes, because class is above order. So if you're in the same order, you must be the same class, phylum, kingdom, and domain. So I'd say that's correct. Let's just see what's, why the, what's the other ones. They are classified in different phyla. No, phyla is even higher. So if they're in the same order, they're definitely the same phyla. 
They are classified in the same family. They don't need to be. See, they're the same order, but that doesn't mean they need to be the same family, because family is more specific. Maybe they're different in the family level. They are classified in different kingdoms. No, same kingdom. If they're same order, it means they're same class, same phylum, same kingdom. So you can see this question would be very difficult to answer if, you're, if you don't remember the, the classification order. If you don't remember the, which one's first, domain, kingdom, phylum, you need to remember this order. It's very important. Okay, great. Next. Which information can be concluded from this karyotype? So here we have a karyotype. You can see the order from big to small, and this last one is our sex chromosomes determining male or female. So first we can see that this person, we normally look here, has a big X and a small Y, so it's a male. So we know this is a male. Are they normal? Uh, when you look at the chromosomes, uh, they all seem the same. They're the correct size, and there isn't three. There isn't one missing or one additional anywhere. Like each pair has two. That's two, 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 two. Yeah, this person seems normal. This will be a normal male. Okay. Sometimes I like to ask about Down syndrome because that's a very easy example where you would look at chromosome 21 uh, here and it would have three chromosomes. So that'd be abnormal. But this person doesn't have that. Next one. I'm showing you this one because I want to teach you something here. Um, so what does this the karyotype below correspond to? So again, let's look. Now you look here, you only see one chromosome. Oh, so you're going to be like, oh, but here's also only one chromosome. This is abnormal. This is abnormal. No. Sometimes they show it like this where they put the, the, the sex chromosomes together, the X and the Y, and sometimes they put them separate. So they put the X on its own and the Y on its own. But this is still normal, so bear this in mind. Sometimes the sex chromosomes are put together, sometimes they are separated, but they will always be at the end. They will be the last pair. So you can see here, this is still normal person because they have two, 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 it's normal. And at the end, instead of putting the X and the Y together, they put them separate, but that's still normal. It's one X, one Y, so what is it? It's a male. So this is still a male, just like the previous one. The only difference is the way they showed it in the karyogram. Okay, this one shows it together, this one shows it separate. So don't get confused with that. There's no, everything else is normal, so yeah. Okay, last question here. Which is a source of chromosomes for prenatal diagnosis of abnormalities by karyotyping? So remember, where do we get our DNA from when we make a karyogram? Let's go up to our karyogram. When we make our karyogram, right, where do we get the sample from? From one of these three things, chronic bilis sampling, blood sample, or amniotic fluid. So if we look at this question, where do we get it from? Sperm? Nope. Ovaries? Nope. Erythrocytes? Nope. Chronic villi? Yes. That's one example of where we can get it from. So that's it for this video. I hope it was, was, uh, I hope it was useful. I know there's a lot of stuff. But this is all you need to know for A3.1. I hope it makes sense. I hope you learned something. And I'll see you in the next one.